It turns out Saddam Hussein did possess a weapon of mass destruction, and he used it in a slaughter that few people have heard of until now. After the Gulf War in 1991, Saddam spent untold millions on a weapon designed to exterminate an ancient civilization called the Madan, also known as the Marsh Arabs. They lived in Iraq between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, where many biblical scholars place the Garden of Eden. But if this was the place where man fell from grace, Saddam showed just how far man can fall. In a spectacular feat of engineering, he used water in a strike against his own people that not even an atom bomb could match. Back in 2009, we journeyed there with an American engineer who's resurrecting this magical land that was turned to dust by Saddam's secret weapon. The story will continue in a moment. We are now officially inside the marsh. And you can see the reeds getting denser and denser, taller and taller. Azam Alwash grew up in the water world that the Greeks named Mesopotamia, the land between two rivers. I gotta tell you, this is not like any part of Iraq I've ever seen before. Right? I mean, you, when you say Iraq, it's a desert, right? It's, it's uh, uh, burning oil. Hey, it's, it's, it's magical is what it is. This is magic. It's been more than 30 years since he pushed through the reeds with his father, who ran the irrigation office here. So I have very warm memories of this place. In 1978, Alwash left to study in America and became a partner in an engineering firm. I achieved the, the American dream, Scott. You'd been living in the United States yeah. for 25 years. Yeah, You're an yeah, American yeah. citizen. Yes. You married an American woman. Yes. Your children are as American as they can be. And, and I'm as American as can be. <laughs> Why did you imagine going back to Iraq after the life you had built? I realized at some point in time that, that money and success and the American dream is not everything. Working on passion, on something that drives you, is everything. His passion is a world where Mother Nature meets Father Time. It's the cradle of civilization outlined by the Tigris and Euphrates, the likely birthplace of agriculture, the written word, and the wheel. But once the ancients set civilization on its course, the Madan stayed behind. Their villages are primitive. They weave a life out of the reeds of the marsh. They bind them into homes, feed them to their water buffalo, and burn them to bake their bread. There's not much in the way of electricity, education, or health care. But elders like Sahih Saleh told us they did just fine until 1991, when they suffered their own kind of holocaust. That was when the U.S. and its allies invaded southern Iraq to throw Saddam out of Kuwait. But there's another way for the bloodshed to stop. The elder President Bush urged Iraqis to overthrow their dictator. To take matters into their own hands. The Madan and other Shiites in the south supported an uprising to topple Saddam's regime. The marshes, known for ages as a smuggler's paradise, turned out to be a perfect place for the rebels to hide with their endless maze of waterways like these on the Iranian border. But in 1991, when the Allies withdrew, Saddam turned Eden into hell. The United Nations Environmental Program called it the biggest engineered environmental disaster of the last century. Saddam tried to wipe out the Marsh Arabs by destroying their world. He built six canals to divert the waters of the Tigris and Euphrates out into the desert and the Persian Gulf. In a five-year project, he drained 90% of the marshes, an area of more than 3,000 square miles. As an engineer, I'm telling you, drying of the marshes is definitely not an easy task. It's a monumental engineering project. He put every piece of equipment available in Iraq under his control at the services of the projects needed to dry the marshes. Saddam was using water as a weapon. You know, the world was looking for weapons of mass destruction and it was, the evidence was right under its nose. This is a Madan village shot by National Geographic in the 1970s when the marshes were the Middle East's largest wetland. And this is what most of the region looked like after the man-made drought. 
Hunter LZ, War Dog 1 2. To get a sense of the scale of the engineering project, we went to have a look with the Illinois National Guard's 106th Aviation Wing. Maintain 200 feet. That's one of Saddam's canals, designed to capture the water, carry it past the marshes, and dump it in the Persian Gulf. One embankment runs through the middle of the picture, but this man-made canal is so wide, you can hardly see the other side more than a mile away. In fact, it's wider than the Euphrates itself. It's an unbelievable engineering achievement. This is my first time seeing it from the air this close up, and it is, it is spectacular. No one will ever know how many lives were lost and how many families were left in misery by the genocide that followed. They didn't even wait for nature to, to die a natural death. As soon as the embankments were finished, they put light to the reeds of the marsh. Set fire to the reeds. Set fire to the reeds. The cradle of civilization. What Eden was. Was desiccated. Dead. We met some of the survivors, like Sheikh Hassan, returning to the rubble left by Saddam's army. What happened to the village after everyone was ordered out? I mean, what happened to this house? The government gave us three days to get out before the tanks came and crushed our houses. They destroyed about 180 houses in the area. Hassan told us that many of his tribesmen were found in mass graves. Across the region, thousands were killed. About 100,000 were forced from their homes. But then, 12 years later, when Saddam fell, Azam Alwash helped launch a counterattack on the fortress of drought. We're, we're, we're coming to it. It's right there. Oh, this is where this you knocked the hole in, this, the, that's right, that's in the dike. Right, that's right. So you brought heavy earth moving equipment in and, and knocked a hole in what Saddam's engineers had built. Indeed. I, I got the last laugh. <laughs> It was the beginning of his group called Nature Iraq that has developed a plan to restore the marshes. The thing is, it was, it was a small hole. As the water starts flowing, it started digging its own passageway. You just had to break it. Just, just let the water start going. So the, the Euphrates just pushed its way through there yes. once you broke it. Yes, once, once you let the water go in, it just makes its own way. Alwash's travels can be dangerous. This is still a war zone. We traveled with a security team lent by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and with a squad of Iraqi police. Oh, the, the IP is following they us. They found us, yeah. Alwash wasn't sure that just reflooding the barren earth would resurrect what was lost. But when we traveled deeper into the marshes, we saw what sprung up since the waters returned in 2003. There. Oh, look at that. Look at that. We have entered another time. <laughs> this is the water world <laughs> in the middle of the desert. Wow. All these houses built with nothing but reeds. Without reeds, you can't have this way of life. Reeds are the skeleton of these people's lives. The house of reeds is called a mudif. Awash wanted one as a meeting hall for his project. And we were there to watch the construction. It's made of nothing but reeds bound by reeds. The arches are planted in the ground and pulled into shape. Then woven mats cover the top. Alwash's Modif is 15 feet tall and 70 feet long. It's where we did our interview and where one of the village elders came to entertain us. <laughs> Have a look at the Medif and compare it to this 5,000-year-old carving. Turns out, they do build them like they used to. Near the marshes, the Sumerians erected this temple at the city of Ur. The Sumerians thought the marshes were so important, they wrote a story about them. The story goes that the gods grew angry at man, so they sent a deluge to cover the earth. One of the gods thought that was a terrible idea, so he warned one man to build a boat and save all the animals. The people of this region came up with that story hundreds of years before the Old Testament gave us Noah. The city of Ur is said to be the birthplace of Abraham, the father of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now his descendants are returning to a life that he might have recognized. 
This cluster behind us is a cluster of about three islands built by generations, over generations. Dirt, reed, dirt, reed. Every time it settles, they add a new layer. And that's how they make their islands. Yes. That's the Sumerian creation story that God laid down reed mats yes and created man and created the world. Indeed, indeed, exactly. They took it from their lives and, you know, of course the gods lived the way they do, you know, <laughs> and this is Eden. <laughs> What's happening now is sort of a second creation story. Thousands of marsh Arabs have returned to this land since the reflooding began, and the Madan are rebuilding their islands with a few changes that Abraham would not have imagined. These people are restoring the marshes not because they're tree huggers like I am, they're restoring the marshes because they are trying to live. It's not because they love the birds flying or, uh, or the, the reeds uh, look nice. It's about, it's about livelihood. We saw that when we came up on a reed market. Families were bringing their harvest to a place where the new waters spelled the end of Saddam's road. What is your hope for this place? My hopes, I see the marshes as a destination for ecotourism. I see the marshes as a destination for archeological tourism. But you know, that's a very nice picture. Mm -hmm. But this is a country at war. Yeah, okay, so the, course, the war is not gonna last forever. If you're gonna dream, dream big, it's free. Alwash is lobbying parliament to make his boyhood home Iraq's first national park but no matter how big the dream, the marshes will never be what they once were. Upstream, as far as Turkey and Syria, there are more than 30 dams diverting water. There's a serious drought right now, and oil has been discovered here. Exploration will surely follow. Still, about 50% of the marshes have been reflooded. The land of civilization's past has a future again. Since our story first aired, Alwash has been working to build an ecotourism camp in the marshes and is planning to welcome his first visitors next March.